Fever Live. My name is Steve Mascord, and if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit the buttons down below. And uh, without any further ado, what an amazing uh, guest we've got from Saxon. It's Biff Byford. Hello, Biff. How are you, mate? I'm um, good, thank you. Very good. What part of the world are you coming to us from? Uh, I'm in England today, uh, and I'm a studio. Right. Well, I am too. So, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, the... the uh, we're getting to that uh, time of the year now where it's hopefully about to warm up. Um, now, we are obviously talking uh, about, about the new album Carpe Diem, Biff, and um, every, that's what you're talking to everybody about. Uh, but I've been doing a bit of research uh, and I, I, heard, I, you know, I was just reading about the sort of um, you know, travails that you had at the beginning of this process of, uh, of, of putting this album together. Um, and I, I just wondered whether you know, you, um, there was, there was um, some medical issues with a heart condition and then I've also heard about, read about hearing loss. And I just wondered, uh, is that, did that inform the name of the record? Was that, is that why it was called that? You know, make the most of uh, the day? Uh, I probably, I probably see the day. It's very positive. I was going to call the album Pilgrimage, uh, which is another cool title. Uh, but um, now I thought Seize the Day was positive. You know, we're coming out of COVID a bit. Uh, I was hopefully, it would have been done by now when I wrote the song. But it's still with us. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a positive, uh, you know, um, yeah, it's a positive, um, it's a positive message. Seize the day, you know, take every day as it comes, make it the best of the day, you know, mm. like they say in USA, have a nice day, you know, it's just <laughs> seize the day, you know, it's just a, a positive thing, really, you know. Yeah. Maybe given that, it wasn't a good time to be ill or any sort of illness, was it, because of COVID? Was it a well, flying uh, period it, for you? Were well, you... yeah, I, I came, it came, uh, it was about two and a half years ago now, really. Uh, mm. uh, it was in, it was in um, September, actually longer than two and a half years. So it was before, it basically was after my solo album came out, mm. really, is when I had the, the heart problem. Mm. Uh, so we were writing, uh, we were writing this album then, you know, mm. in sort of, uh, sort of 2019-ish, really. I mean, we'd come back from America with Judas, I've touring with Judas Priest, and I said, look, I'm going to start, you know, working on ideas for the new album, so send me some ideas, boys. And um, so that's where it started, really. Mm. And luckily, we were able to rehearse together, uh, going through the music and arrangements that I had, I had, I had ideas for. Uh, before COVID, mm. and then uh, Nigel did the drums, and then COVID hit, I think, in March uh, a couple of years ago. So, yeah, so that's how it went, really. So yeah, I think, sorry. I think you know, writing the lyrics, probably the COVID thing affected me more than writing the music, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and so there was no thought of maybe taking it easy because you've been a bit, as we say in Australia, crook. <laughs> um, you never, you know, you didn't think, well, I might just take a bit of time off here and just get better and and not worry about writing a new record. It never crossed your mind? <laughs> well, I had, to, I had to look at some time off, you know, because I, mm -hmm. learn, learn, I had to learn to sing again, for one thing, because mm. they, they cut your chest open, don't they? And, uh, you know, stop your heart and all sorts of weird things when you have that operation. So it took me a while to, to sing again, but uh, it didn't stop me writing, you know, writing mm -hmm. lyrics and things. So I used that time to um, to think about things, you know, uh, you know, life and mortality and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I think I think "Seize the Day" is perfect title for that, really. What conclusions did you um, reach? Uh, if it's not too personal, um, sorry. What, what? Well, in, the, in in that time, that time that you spent sort of contemplating um, all that, yeah. all those big issues, did you? What conclusions did you reach? Can you help any help us? Uh, well, I don't. I, the, 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 well, to tell you the truth, that. The, the, the only conclusion is, is to just carry on. <laughs> just like, that's the conclusion you come to. Because mm. if you just like, you know, curl up and, you know, let yourself get too down, too depressed and too, you know, it's just not good for you. So you have to try and stay with a positive attitude. I know it's difficult, very difficult. I don't know how difficult that is, uh, believe me. But to, yeah. to try and, um, you know, Try and put the doubt, darkest, darker thoughts to one side and really think about the future. I think, I think that's the, that whether you have like, you know, 60 years in front of you or whether you have like 
a few years, I think you have to think towards moving on, you know. And um, but without, but not before sort of one glance over the shoulder with the song "Remember the Fallen." Um, and I, I imagine that the response has been very uh, positive t- to that. Although I guess you'll always get some people who don't like something you well, do. But... Well, yeah. You know, I mean, I wrote that song quite late on, and I, I, obviously I wrote it because I thought it might be finished by now. Mm. So, you know, when the album came out, I never, 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 never thought for a moment when I wrote it. Yeah, a year ago, we'd still have COVID with us. Uh, so the song's very current, obviously, because it's still there. But um, yeah, I wanted to write a song about my thoughts about it. You know, the mm. first line is, it came across the China Sea. No one knew the brother, you and me. You know, and it, it you know, it, it took some people and, and didn't take other people. I, I find that uh, really, really strange. Uh, and, and you know, it's just, I just wanted to write a song about remembering people, really, the you know, friends and families that people lost, and um, you know, the frontline people that you know risked their lives in the first year, definitely the first year of the pandemic. It was crazy, and I wanted to do it as if it was a war, and I think it was a war against the virus, actually. So yeah, that, that's my thoughts on the song, remembering the people that um, went before their time because of it, you know. Indeed. And uh, another um, song which is really interesting to me anyway in the subject matter, uh, Biff, is, uh, is Lady in Grey. Um, and I, I did read an interview <laughs> where you, you did talk about, you know, taking your son and his girlfriend to this sort of haunted uh, castle and, uh, and, and, and that, that's where the, that inspired the, the song. And you said you have had experiences, sort of supernatural experiences you've seen I think you said you said you've seen cats walk through walls. Did you grow uh, up? Yeah, that was obviously <laughs> obviously not every day. Yeah, but, uh, just, <laughs> it just you know, I, the thing is, you know, there's a lot of haunting goes on. There's always noises and bangs and scrapes. But you know, I mean, I've never actually seen anything like in a mirror. You know, like that mm. crystal clear. It's just you see things out the corner of your eye. You get a glance of something. You know, like a door opens for no reason. I mean, I, I saw a lot of this stuff. In, I used to live in France for a while in a big chateau, yeah. Well, it wasn't mm. a big one. It was, it was actually a small chateau, but it was, it was bigger than your average house. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, we saw a few things in there, you know, bright lights in the corner of rooms. And uh, the kids at that time were pretty scared sometimes. Uh, but, yeah, you know, I saw some, I thought I saw some children on the stairs. But things like that, really. But the story mm. is about, um, I booked, I booked uh, my son for his, uh, I think it was his birthday present. I booked him and his girlfriend <laughs> yeah, <laughs> into yeah, yeah. a castle, the most haunted room in, in England, yeah, a <laughs> castle in England. And uh, the room is called the Grey Room. And um, the Lady in Grey haunts it. That's, that's all I can say. And uh, if you look into Lady in Grey, there's quite a lot of ladies in greys. You know, there's a lot of these, there's a lot of these spooky, spooky women walking around, and they're all sort of grey, you know what I mean? So, um, but this particular one is quite a famous one, and uh, uh, her, her, I think her, her husband left her, and she died of a broken heart, apparently. So she wanders around the corridors uh, looking for her husband, basically. So it's quite a sad song, and, uh, you know, I think it's cool doing a ghost story. I quite like it, you know. Hey, what was the report from your son and his girlfriend about the evening? Were there? Well, no. Unfortunately, it got cancelled because of COVID. Ah, I'm so sorry. It, so it's, it's still pending, actually. <laughs> so it, if it goes there in the next few months, I'll let you know. Come some of the other some of the other um, songs uh, on the album, like Age of Steam, Dam Busters. As a fifty three year old man, I instinctively understand those cultural references. But I just wonder, you do you are kids today being taught the same things at school? I mean, like Dan Busters to me evokes sort of nineteen fifties movies, um, and Age of Steam is a you know a specific period in history. Um, yeah. But the, do we just assume that people will always be taught about these things in school, or or, or are they or, or are they changing? Are they sort of going away? Are kids not necessarily learning these things anymore? Well, I, th- I think you know, I think I think. The things like Dambos, it's a very sort of, you know, I was born in the 50s, so, you know, I grew up with all that sort of 
you know, boy zone, soldiers fighting, you know, playing with soldiers and things. Uh, so I was brought up in that, uh, in that era, you know, when you had toy soldiers and you had model railway engines and things. So for me, it was all part of my life. But I suppose now it's a part of history and it's very nostalgic. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I think people, I don't think people are talking about the dam busters anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think it's just one of those things that happen and really weird things that happen in the war, you know, that uh, these young young airmen, like 17, 18 year olds were sent off on this sort of bit of a suicide mission where they did to drop some bouncing bombs on a, on a dam in Germany, you know, but uh, it, there were legends uh, in, 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 the, in England at that mm-hmm. time. Mm. Uh, and there was a lot of films and a lot of books about them when I was at school. So, um, but I think the age of steam, it's about the industrial revolution. So mm. I think people would learn about that. Like mm. they would learn about the splitting of the atom, you know, mm. with the, with the atom bomb, uh, yeah. cause it's part of, uh, technology, you know, uh, the age of steam really. Uh, so that's what it's about. You know, it's like, let's like, say in America, you know, and, it would be the steam trains that, that, that opened up the West, you know. I yeah. mean, it was all, it was all steam powered. So, you know, the state's coach uh, stopped and the steam train, you know, took over the iron horse. And, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the outlaws would rob the trains instead of the state's coach. So it was, you know, it, it, you saw that in films as well all the time, especially in the 60s, you know. Metal has got to be the most educational musical genre, I think. Jackson, um, and uh, we're talking about the new album, Carpe D. And Biff, three years ago, uh, you, didn't, you don't know it, but we were both on a boat. Uh, we're on the Monsters of Rock cruise. And they're just uh, pulling right. out now. I believe they're on the second uh, night. So I'm hugely envious of them. Um, and I just, um, I wonder, uh, America holds a special place in your heart, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's a place where... To me, Saxon are a big band. I hear denim and leather on Eddie Trunk every time I turn it on. But I, I guess I get a feeling that you think Saxon could have been bigger in America. And not only that, can still be bigger in America. Yeah, well, you know, this album, everybody's talking about it uh, over in America. So, yeah, well, fingers crossed. It may well, uh, it may well uh, you know, bring us to a point where we can, uh, you know, uh, you know, be like, be, be known all over America rather than in specific places, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, I mean, denim and leather, you know, people know denim and leather, and people don't even know it's us sometimes <laughs> <laughs> because, because it gets played on radio and they don't say who it is. You got this denim and leather, you know, and that, you know, it's like, who was that? No, I don't know. It's great though. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, um, it's uh, it is crazy that that sort of thing happens, but um, you know, as long as we're getting played, we're happy. You know, it's uh, I think I think you know the, the Saxon the Saxon sort of legacy is still very active, and we're still really excited about bringing out new albums. You know, we wanna we want to. Uh, I mean, this album is a statement that says, "Look, you know, we're back. We're on it. Seize the day. Let's go for it." And that. This album's a very positive album, I think. And uh, hopefully people will just get the vibe, you know, and get into it. Now, I don't know how much, much you read reviews. I mean, you've, uh, you've probably had more, as many reviews as you've done dinners. Uh, sorry, as many <laughs> reviews as you've done interviews, which is more than you've had hot dinners, I was going to say. But the, yeah. but, but the, um, the, the interview in Classic Rock sort of suggested that there was, there was three, um, the review in Classic Rock of uh, Carpe Diem suggested there's been three stages of Saxon's career. One where you're a straight ahead metal band and there were those classic records. And then one where you tried to um, get rich and you're on EMI and, uh, and, and, did, and did some pop. And then the third, is, the third stage is exactly like the first stage. <laughs> so um, it was, was, there, um, was there a period where you were kind of like, you know, I wouldn't mind sort of driving around in a Ferrari and living well, in Hollywood I, I, Hills? I, I, I think it's a bit of a simplistic sort of synopsis, you know what I mean? It's like <laughs> summing it up like that. I suppose what you can say is, is that, you know, the, sort of the, the, the first 10, 10 years were great, and then we sort of lost our way a little bit. And, uh, and then, you know, in the next 10 years, and then the, next, the 10 years after that, we got, our, we got ourselves together. You know, mm-hmm. so I think probably right, 
But I don't think the, you know, trying to break America and be rich thing, I don't think that really was any was in the band's heads. Mm-hmm. It might have been in the manager, producer, record company's heads. But the band were just trying to write great, great tracks, really. And uh, yeah. I think I think we were produced a bit stranger, you know. It's like, um, you know, it's, this, it's like studios. Yeah, you went and made a record in America. But it's the same equipment, you know. You, you don't have special equipment in America that we don't have in England or Australia <laughs> or, or, or France. It's all the same equipment. It's actually the guys that make the album that are different, mm-hmm. you know, and their, their input into the album it makes it makes the, makes the band different. And sometimes, you know, back in that, that time, uh, a lot of the producers in, in sort of late 80s, 90s, well, late 80s, I would say, got involved with the songwriting quite a lot. And uh, so that sort of sometimes sort of uh, cut your balls off a bit, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we went through that, and you know we came through it. You know it was great. Um, you know a lot of the fans were like, you know, what the hell's going on here? But uh, they stuck with us, and we we came through. You know, and that's just uh, I think all bands that have been going for forty, fifty years all go through that uh, sort of the chemistry of the band not being quite right. And something, something a bit, bit askew, you know, not quite running, you know, we're missing one of the cylinders, you know what I'm saying? And then, you know, you go through that, and then you suddenly think, you know, why, why aren't we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Let's, let's get it all back on track again, you know? Yep, yep. Um, before you go, uh, Biff, uh, there's some questions from some uh, um, fans. Ian Blair, yeah. Ian Blair, who I think might run one of your fan pages on uh, Facebook. He said, um, Saxon have obviously written uh, loads of classic songs. Uh, the new album Carpe Diem is awesome. My question to Biff is, have you written the song you've always wanted to write? I hope that makes sense. So I think he might mean the perfect song, the song that sums you up better than any other. Uh, on the new album, you mean, or ever? Yeah, is there still something you're Obviously reaching on for? the new album? I want to say Pilgrimage, basically. Right. I've, I have, I've had the title Pilgrimage in my head for like 10 years or so, you know? Mm. And I kept trying to put it in, in into a song, it never really worked. Mm. And then uh, I think Paul, Paul Quinn came up with this riff and it sort of fitted my ideas of the song, you know, so it worked really well. So it went in there and it turned out uh, pretty great, actually. I, I couldn't really uh, have thought we could have done that song any better, you know? Mm. And second question is from uh, Peter Piers, who says, in February, no, here's one, here's one of those ones that <laughs> very specific from a long time ago. He says, during February 1986, one of the bands that opened for Saxon in the USA was an Aussie band called Heaven. Uh, by that time, with three Americans yeah. in the lineup. Any recollection of them, and especially uh, frontman Alan Fryer, who we lost a few years ago, sadly. Yeah. Um, his it, crazy antics. Yeah, he was a big drinker. I remember that. He used to drink Jack Daniels on stage like a full bottle or something, which was uh, which is pretty crazy because uh, a lot of bands use tea <laughs> that looks like Jack Daniels. You know what I mean? But he did it. <laughs> he did it. It was for, real. <laughs> he did it for real, and uh, yeah, we had some crazy times with him because it was pretty crazy back then. Uh, you know, the whole rock and roll thing, the MTV thing. It was like uh, it was abs- uh, yeah, It was a bit Sodom and Gomorrah at the time, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah, they were a great band, actually. They were a little bit, um, little bit sort of acdc vibe, I remember. You know, mm. it was quite rock and roll. Like, it, wasn't, it wasn't really heavy metal, if you know what I mean. But, uh, yeah, I remember they were a great band, great singer, great characters, definitely. Well, they, they had that song in the beginning that had bits of different famous riffs, if you remember. Um, but, uh, yeah, I vaguely remember that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, have a listen to it. It's a pretty cool song. And final, yeah. final question. Would Saxon ever play Stone Dead Festival? I think we might have been able to play it a couple of times or once. Um, hey, listen, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, if, if, if we can get there and there's going to be, you know, tons of fans that want us to be there, then we'll go there. You know, we don't, uh, we don't make decisions based on anything else, but, um, you know, do people, want, do people want us to play there? You know, it's like, it's like touring America or Australia or, you know, France or Sweden. You know, people have to want you to be there so you can tour. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we definitely played Stone Dead 
Um, it's just, uh, just if it fits into the schedule, because the thing is these days with festivals, they all want you, to, you all want you to play exclusively for them, and uh, especially if you're in the UK, you know it's not a very big place. So if you play, say Bloodstock exclusively, you can't do some of the other festivals within a certain time frame. So it's it's all political. I just say we should seize the day and go for it. <laughs> what a way to end.